our interpreters know. So thank you both very much. I think um, we've had two um, very, very um, fundamental and uh, in-depth going uh, analysis as the two keynote uh, for the start. Now, I don't really want to ask you questions. I just really would like first the two of you um, maybe to exchange uh, in your an an analysis, because obviously we have a huge literature now and uh, a lot of uh, scientists from different disciplines looking at the question of war and of course it was uh, said this morning, um, it's very useful sometimes to have a hundred years or whatever uh, to get um, societies and scientists to look more closely again um, maybe at things they've been looking at for some time. Um, so maybe when we see this huge literature and you both have contributed to it, maybe just as a first question from me before we then uh, ask you see if you have different ways of seeing what you've been saying. Um, how, how is your impression of the discourse at the moment? Have, have, are we also in this whole um, um, engagement in what's happening or what has happened? Are we really seeing new aspects and um, we are having some, I think, new arguments? Uh, certainly the question of uh, who is responsible and this kind of question. Um, I look uh, just very quickly uh, at Herfried Münkler, um, the question which is sometimes asked, how do we be more differentiated on what leads to a certain um, type of war at a certain time, um, who is responsible in the main or, or not responsible. How do we do that with beco without becoming culturally <coughs> relativist or apologetic would be a question which always I think of being a sociologist. I should start answering. Yes, please. Okay, aber ich spreche auf Deutsch. Ja. <laughs> Muss man mich nicht gleich übersetzen. Ich glaube, die entscheidende Frage bei der ähm, Analyse, wie Gesellschaften Krieg thematisieren, ob sie ihn beforschen oder eher versuchen, äh, aus dem Spiel herauszunehmen, welche Vorstellungen von einer im Prinzip gewaltfreien internationalen Politik sie entwickeln oder ob sie dem Konzept anhängen, dass es zu einer Transformation des Krieges in Form einer großen Polizeiaktion, also Maurice Janowitz hat das die Konstabularisierung des Krieges genannt, kommt. Die, dies alles hängt in hohem Maße davon ab, erstens, ob diese Gesellschaften sich verantwortlich fühlen für eine politische Ordnung, die mehr ist als nur die Integrität ihres eigenen Territoriums. Das ist ein zentrales Problem der bundesdeutschen Diskussion. Ähm, Im Prinzip haben wir uns daran gewöhnt äh, gehabt, dass äh, wir, okay, eingebunden in die NATO, aber im Wesentlichen Territor das Territorium der Bundesrepublik Deutschland zu schützen haben. Punkt. Und äh, die Entwicklungen der letzten 20 Jahre vermutlich haben dazu geführt, dass klar ist, das ist erstens nicht bedroht, jedenfalls nicht im unmerkbaren Sinn, Helmut Kohls Formel, wir sind umzingelt von Freunden. Aber es gibt ein Problem gewissermaßen des Investierens in Sicherheit. Das heißt, der Begriff des Friedens hat sich verändert. Frieden ist, wenn wir es analytisch betrachten, nicht wirklich mehr sinnvoll zu definieren als die Abwesenheit von Gewalt, sondern Frieden muss definiert werden als ein kollektives Gut. Und ein kollektives Gut ist ein schwieriger Begriff, also ein Begriff aus der Volkswirtschaftslehre. Es ist definiert dadurch, dass alle daran partizipieren, und keiner vom Genuss dieses Gutes ausgeschlossen werden kann in Relation dazu, was er eingezahlt hat. Das heißt, im Hinblick auf den Frieden entsteht das klassische Problem der Drittbrettfahrer. Ich möchte es haben, aber ich will möglichst wenig da rein investieren. Und diesen Diskussionsprozess haben wir im Augenblick in Deutschland, auch in den Wissenschaften, aber sozusagen in der Politik angekommen, jetzt mit den Äußerungen von Herrn Gauck, Frau von der Leyen und von Herrn Steinmeier. Man könnte sagen, in, in mancher Hinsicht ähm, nähert sich Deutschland oder die Bundesrepublik Deutschland wieder äh, gewissermaßen einem französisch-amerikanisch-britischen äh, Modell des Investierens in Sicherheit an. Das wird noch viele Auseinandersetzungen und Verwerfungen haben. Wenn ich noch einen Punkt machen darf, dann wäre es der, 
dass wir alle, jedenfalls als westliche Gesellschaften, das sind, was ich postheroische Gesellschaften nenne. Das heißt Gesellschaften, in der ein Konzept von Männlichkeit, also ein verpflichtendes Konzept von Männlichkeit nicht an die Bereitschaft zum Selbstopfer gebunden ist. Vermutlich ist sozusagen das Modell der heroischen Gesellschaft eines, das zwischen 1792, also der Ausrufung der Levée en masse durch Lazare Carnot und dem Ende des Ersten Weltkrieges sich durchgehalten hat. Und danach gewissermaßen gibt es einen erhöhten Zwang durch Equipment, die fehlende Disposition des Heroischen zu ersetzen. Respekt vor den Briten würde ich sagen, Charakteristisch dafür ist Churchills Äußerung über die Air Force, der sagte, nie hatten so viele, so wenigen so viel zu verdanken. Nicht? Also sozusagen, es wird nicht mehr die Masse eingesetzt, sondern es werden wenige mit einem avancierten Equipment eingesetzt, die in der Lage sind, diese Effekte zu erzielen. Das heißt, Krieg wird wieder ein zunehmend eine, Ange eine Angelegenheit von Spezialisten, dafür steht ja der Begriff der Drohne, und anderes und der Rest der Gesellschaft schaut zu und evaluiert das. John, would you like to comment on? First of all, my question and the answer from Pippin Rumita, and then we can perhaps get on to your uh, differences or agreements. This is, this is working, yes. Um, uh, Churchill actually said, uh, you're quite right, but he said uh, that the famous quote um, was not to the Air Force, it was to Fighter Command and fighter command was defending British soil. He never said the same thing to bomber command that was bombing Germany. But it's a very, very important distinction, very important distinction, and takes me to the, to the heart of what I, what I want to say. I and mean, I, I agree with your distinction. I think we, le we, we live, perhaps we always have lived, in a world in which peace is not the absence of war, um, but it's the maintenance of order, or rather of an order. And much depends on where you're invested in that order and whether you think that order is a good thing or a bad thing. And there, I think a very important and fruitful political thinker, a philosopher to look at at this is, of, of course, um, Hobbes uh, in, his, in his work Leviathan, written in the late 17th century. The English philosopher, of course, is looking at the chaos and the anarchy which has occurred in Britain in the civil wars of the 17th century, and who therefore imagines the strong state, the strong state of the restoration, but the strong state which will restore order. But of course, We've seen other strong states which are producers of order which is so uh, uh, dysfunctional for many of the people uh, beneath it uh, that it requires force in order to overcome it. And I sometimes feel that we, you know, we, we, we operate along a kind of uh, a Hobbesian spectrum between chaos at the one hand or potential chaos and an overruling force on the other. Uh, which produces an order uh, which is um, uh, 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 an order which I certainly would not want to uh, to see, um, and and th there are big historic shifts along that sort of axis. Now, whether in the uh, with the absence of the bipolar war of the Cold War, that world I described, which was at some level kind of frozen in in its outer parameters, we're moving towards a, a non-polar world, not even a one-polar world, but a non-polar or a multipolar world, which is opening up the potential spectrum of um, that Hobbesian chaos um, is, is, I think, a question really to be um, borne in mind. Because if that is so, uh, then what we have is the attempt by Western uh, ideas of, of security and order, in which the, the Bundesrepublik, of course, has a very important part to play, um, faced with a destabilization of a kind which we really haven't seen, um, really perhaps since 1945, if we argue that the Cold War was a kind of stabilization. So as always, it's a question of trying to, 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 to plot, to kind of um, a, a, a sense of what's, what's coming in the future, and it's not an easy thing to do. Just a couple of other remarks on, 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 on your question and, and ways in which we can perhaps try to use 1914 to think about the um, present. Um, the, the, the notion that, um, uh, that, that a legitimate form of, um, uh, of, of, of security and of order is one based on self-defense, even, I don't know if this came up in the discussion last night, but that one of the notions of a just war is that it's a war of self-defense. There are lots of things we could say objectively are unjust, wars of aggrandizement and so on and so forth, but a just war is one of self-defense. But the problem is, what, what I want to inject here is the notion of the perceptual. 
of the cultural, I mean, of who defines what. If we look at the summer of 1914, many contemporaries felt that there was no, no particular reason for war at all. Um, that this was a summer of peace, that it had been more peaceful than the world had been, certainly since the, uh, uh, the First Balkan War two years before. When the countries did go to war, and I'm not now talking about the inner calculations, who knew what and who was playing what game with what, but, but what is very clear is that everybody had to present the war exactly as Churchill did to fighter command. This is a self-defensive war. Austria-Hungary said this is a self-defensive war because unless we eliminate Serbia, which is what it amounted to, it's the end of a dynastic multinational empire. And the German ambassador says as much to the French foreign minister in uh, uh, Paris on the, the 23rd of, um, of August. F for Germany, it was, uh, and the Kaiser says, he says it in a kind of this dry run for the First World War, the First Balkan War. He says, it's to, es geht um der Zeit oder nicht sein Deutschlands. What happens in Austria-Hungary is a question of German existential survival. So somehow we're living in a cultural world in 1914 in which, however minimal, the uh, causes of the war might seem to us, the causes for a war, at the time, this was perceived as existential, a struggle for survival by the different parties concerned. One final comment on that, which is war itself. Nonetheless, for people to have, and, and I often feel that, that in some ways we're still asking the wrong question. We have endless books on the origins of the war, the causes of the war, the responsibilities of the war, but we never talk about war. And unless we can culturally reconstruct what people imagined by war in 1914, then I think it's very difficult to understand why they were prepared to engage in what they did engage in, which was a really tough diplomatic confrontation in which rather like a duel, you know, you're, you talked about martial masculinity, your, your, mas your, your male honour as a country is on the line, ultimately you've got to be prepared to go to war to, to uh, that's the ultimate sanction. Not, not that you want to do it, but you've got to be prepared to do it. And therefore there's an understanding that, that war can play that role, that war is still at some level a political instrument, that you can use, you may win, you may lose, um, but you use it to get an outcome in the way that you were describing, and, um, uh, and, and in that sense it's a rational calculation. And I think that if you ask me what's changed since 1914, I would say that at least in a lot of the world, there is the, the, the perception that, that war, that genie in the bottle, that genie which finally lodged in the form of nuclear annihilation at the, at the basis of the Cold War, that's the genie in the bottle, that's the trajectory we went through from 14 to 45, and that we're always playing with that, there's always that danger at the back of one's mind, and people didn't have that perception in 1914. But my final point, and it's a question really to, 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 to Professor Munkley, is that you talked, and it was very engaging I think, your, your description about um, tactics and strategy and how you, how you try to learn in military terms, but the difficulties of converting that into political Political terms when the war is going on. Th th one of the difficulties I find is that when studying the First World War and, and reading the generals and the politicians, they all talk the language of calculation and control. No surprise, they're paid to do that. You don't have generals who don't come up with plans of war. That's what their business is. You don't have foreign ministers who don't have diplomatic war aims. That's what their purpose is. But I would just want to put this question out. I think, for me, the salient feature of the First World War, which, which, which I tried to convey, is that it escaped control. Actually, for much of the time, the generals and the politicians were not in control. They may have been in control of their foreign officers or of their troops, but they were not in control of the process of war. And that helps explain the radical disproportion between whatever it was that caused the war and the dramatic effect, the war itself. The war was the revolution of the 20th century, and it transformed the world subsequently in a way that nobody had anticipated. And so that, it seems to me, is the ultimate danger with war. You can nus just never tell. It's like a chemical experiment that you're trying in, you've tried in the laboratory, now you do it for real. And you can only ever do it for real once the first time. And you just don't know what's going to come out of it. And that, I think, perhaps more accurately conveys what contemporaries were, were grappling with during the First World War, and still might in our own world, if our attempts at security are faced with, whether it's what happens in the Ukraine or elsewhere, people who are prepared to, to gamble on war in a rather different way than we've been used to doing in the immediate past. Would you like to answer that? Yes, certainly. Yeah, I would like to take this last point again. Denn er beschreibt eigentlich ein prinzipielles Problem, nicht? Also die Verselbstständigung der militärischen Organisation gegenüber der politischen Kontrolle. 
Und diese Verselbstständigung hat etwas damit zu tun, dass die Heere, ich glaube, Sie hatten das ja in, ihrer, in Ihrem Vortrag deutlich gesagt, immer größer geworden sind. Und wenn man nicht mehr Heere hat, vielleicht von 30.000 oder 40.000 Mann wie Friedrich II., also überlegt, ob er jetzt erst nach Schlesien oder erst nach Sachsen marschieren soll, und das war eine Entscheidung, die konnte er gewissermaßen im Sattel treffen. Wenn man nun Heere von ähm, Millionen hat, dann ist das eine Frage im Prinzip der Eisenbahnorganisation und der Bereitstellung von Kapazität und der Erarbeitung von Fahrplänen und derlei mehr. Damit Sie eine Vorstellung davon haben, eine deutsche Infanteriedivision hat 1914 3000 Pferde, eine Infanteriedivision, 3000 Pferde. Was das heißt an der Mitführung von Wagen, wo die untergebracht sind, das ist unvorstellbar. Und damit ist auch klar, Sozusagen in dem Augenblick, wo die Mobilisierung begonnen hat, hat die Politik abgedient. Sie hat keine Möglichkeiten mehr. Es gibt eine dramatische Szene. Wilhelm geht zu seinem Generalstabschef, dem jüngeren Moltke, und sagt zu ihm, okay Moltke, wir wollen jetzt gegen Frankreich marschieren, aber wir haben doch im Augenblick mit Frankreich überhaupt gar keine Probleme. Wir haben mit denen keinen Stress. Warum marschieren wir nicht gegen die Russen? Nicht? Also er stellt jetzt die Planung des, Schliefen, äh, des Schliefenplans in Frage. Und Mold gesagt eben, Exzellenz, wenn ich die Truppen nach Osten dirigiere, werden wir im Osten zwei Millionen hungrige, bewaffnete Männer haben, aber keine Armee. Hungrige, bewaffnete Männer, aber keine Armee. Das heißt, der Kaiser ist aus dem Spiel. Jetzt entscheidet im Prinzip der 1C der, des Generalstabs, also der Chef der Aufmarschabteilung des, des großen Generalstabs, der die Fahrpläne im Griff hat. Und das Problem unserer Tage ist gewissermaßen wieder, können wir unter den Bedingungen heutigen Militärs diese sozusagen Eigenständigkeit der Organisationserfordernisse so zurücknehmen, dass die Politik dessen wieder, dessen wieder Herr wird. Das ist der spannende Punkt, unter dem ich auch gerne die Frage der Drohne stellen würde, wenn ich das darf. Also ist die Politik in der Lage, gewissermaßen bis zum letzten Augenblick zu entscheiden, ob etwas passiert oder ob etwas nicht passiert oder ist sie das nicht. Und da würde ich sagen, also wenn ich noch einmal zurückblicke auf die Zeiten der wechselseitigen nuklearen Geiselnahme, da hat die Politik aufgrund der technologischen Entwicklung sehr viel länger die Kontrolle darüber behalten, ob der rote Knopf gedrückt wird oder nicht. Es ist aber klar, wenn sozusagen die Computer sich eigentlich eingeschaltet haben, dann war die Politik aus dem Spiel. Und es gibt nur diesen einen mutigen russischen, sowjetischen müsste ich sagen, Major oder Oberstleutnant, der entgegen den Vorgaben der Computer gesagt hat, es ist kein amerikanischer Angriff, kein Angriff mit Interkontinentalraketen, sondern es ist ein Computerfehler. Ne? Dieser tapfere Mann, der dafür überhaupt nicht belohnt worden ist, außer dass die Dresdner ihm einen Preis verliehen haben, der hat sozusagen in dieser entscheidenden Situation das Ticken der Organisation angehalten. Darüber muss man viel nachdenken. Nicht? Also sozusagen, wie hält man die politische Vernunft im Spiel angesichts der Ausgriffigkeit von Technologie und Organisation? Es gibt natürlich unheimlich viele... Sorry, I'll speak in English again. We have uh, not too much time, uh, because of course then to look at uh, the connection between military and politics on the one hand, but then of course um, the voters and politics on the other, uh, which I think um, also um, depending on whether elections are coming up or not coming up, all these, these kind of uh, cons constellations which may lead to one uh, decision or another decision, which I think are extremely complex. And of course, also the imagination or the differing cultural imaginations of what peace is, which I think takes us back to what you are saying. Um, maybe we have become very complacent because we are used to having um, order uh, and we are used to having uh, peace. So we can't really envisage what uh, that mean, <coughs> may, may mean uh, if we have less order. Um, we, we don't, uh, is, a generation is coming up um, who has no idea really, apart from the images we see on the television of uh, disorder, of uh, extreme um, violence in uh, asymmetrical wars usually in other places. <laughs>